In the previous video, we actually talked about light being two different things, both a wave and a particle. And we described light as a wave um, as it relates to the speed of that light, um, the speed of light being 3 times 10 to the 8th, uh, with wavelength and frequency measurements. Um, light can also be described as a particle. And the particle nature of light actually led uh, through a great deal of controversy, a great deal of work. Um, the first person who really came to that understanding of light be possibly being a particle in nature was a guy by the name of Max Planck, and that was in 1900. He described light as a, a, in quantum, um, or plural being quanta, and that's the minimum amount of energy that can be gained or lost by an atom. So you can think about quantum as minimum energy gained or lost. And so Planck actually believed that light moved in increments. And those increments are what allowed um, the interactions that he saw in his everyday life. He came to write those into an equation where he said the energy of photon or an energy of that light was equal to a constant that he devised times nu, which was your frequency. Okay? And the concept that he came up with known to be later as Planck's constant, was 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds. We'll work with this calculation in class, but it came to describe energy and as how it's related to the frequency. Planck proposed this idea based on something that he was observing. Um, it's something that many people observe, and that was that when you shine metal with a certain frequency of light, or higher, that metal will give off light in very discrete packets of energy. And those discrete packets of energy were the photons that he described in his equation. And so what, what Planck wanted to know was why it was only working in certain increments, and only giving off a certain frequency of light. And so what he postulated is that the energy associated with that frequency was related to his constant, but also was characteristic, and it had to be that way. It had to be in certain increments. You could, for example, have two times that increment to make one color, or you could have three times that increment to make a different color, but there was no in-between. He found that if I had a certain minimum, minimal threshold, it would create one color, in here, red. If I have more than that threshold, and I reach the next one, I produce green, and so forth and so on. Now, where this actually related to was something called the atomic emission spectra. Okay, now, the atomic emission spectra, you can think about as being like an elemental signature. In much the same way that we might sign our names, an element will also sign its name using light. If you hit certain metals with light, it will give off a signature. And that signature you will see appear in the form of colors. Now the opposite of an atomic emission spectra, which is black in most nature and then scatter with some color, would be an atomic absorption of spectra, which is mostly color with missing black spectral lines. When we're looking at these atomic emission spectra, it's important to note that color only appears at very, very certain frequencies. And you, that can be related back to the photoelectric effect in that only threshold amounts of energy can produce a color depending on what type of element we're dealing with at that time. A little over two decades later, a scientist by the name of Niels Bohr in 1922 developed a new model of the atom based on the findings of uh, Max Planck. Now, Niels Bohr believed that the atom worked in much the same way that the planets worked. With the sun in the center, he had discrete orbits set up around it. Now, this fit the particle nature of light theory proposed by Planck in that electrons could jump in small increments from one level to the next. But if they got caught in between, they'd simply fall back down. Think about walking up the stairs uh, um, at your house. If you lift your step up higher than one step, you still have to fall back down to that level to take that step up. It is, however, possible to take multiple steps up at one time. You just have to have the right amount of lift in your feet. 
Well, lift is not necessary here. What we talk about instead are discrete jumps in energy. So the Bohr atom actually was used to explain the spectral lines of hydrogen. So hydrogen was the major focus for Niels Bohr. Now Niels, Bo Niels Bohr's work did yield um, correct results for the spectral lines of hydrogen. Unfortunately, it broke down with every other element. Now what his work did go on to say, though, is that the orbits further away from the nucleus of the atom could actually hold more and more electrons. And so that's a model that, and kind of a takeaway that we bring with us as we develop the model of the atom. A year later, the idea of light um, took another step further with um, a chemist by the name of Louis de Broglie in 1923. Now, de Broglie actually tied the two together by saying that light is not a wave and light is not a particle. Light, in fact, is both. He actually proposed that all moving particles exhibit wave-like characteristics. And those wave-like characteristics can be described in a formula. And so he related the particle nature of light right here with Planck's constant and said that the movement, this right here is movement, this is momentum, that's mass times velocity, actually generates a wave of light. And the wave of light being right here from our C equals lambda nu calculation from before. So de Broglie brought the two worlds together and opened up a whole new door to the development of what was going on with the electrons in the atom. We'll explore this idea a little bit further uh, with our next lesson on atomic orbitals and where we can find electrons.